What's up you guys, Dr. Gooden here to talk about sports psychology in competition and in training. In this video, we will cover arousal, anxiety, and stress. I'm Dr. Jacob Gooden, professor of kinesiology at Point Loma Nazarene University. And in this video, this is the first in a series of four videos working through sports psychology principles, looking at preparation and performance for athletic events. So in this video, we'll be talking about stress, anxiety, and arousal in kind of the opposite order. Now this comes from chapter eight from Essentials of Strength Training and Conditioning. This chapter was written by Statler and Dubois, and it will be part one of four dealing with sports psychology. So let's jump right in. Now within athletics and performance and training, sports psychology has three major goals. The first goal is to measure psychological phenomena. If you can't measure it, then you can't quantify or assess it. And it's not going to do you any good in the future to have these theories or these terms that we're defining if we can't actually measure those things that we're talking about. Uh, next, the goal is to investigate the relationships between psychological and performance variables. So speaking purely in terms of performance, what good does it do to track stress or levels of arousal if we don't know how those might relate to performance? Now, yes, even if we didn't know, it would be good for the well-being of our athletes, the total holistic well-being of our athletes to know these things. But as practitioners whose goal is and who are paid to increase sport performance, we really wanna know what are the relationship between these things so that we can not only achieve good holistic outcomes for our athletes, but also optimal sport performance when it counts. And that really sums up this last point, applying this theoretical knowledge to improve athletic performance so that it goes from theory and into practice. Now, when we talk about the ideal performance state, it involves the following. And this is also known as the flow state. If you read Stealing Fire, that book about how there is, there's actually similarity between extreme sports athletes and Navy SEALs and top CEOs and maybe people who dabble in psychedelics, there's, there's a very similar um, type of state that each of these uh, different people groups achieves and it's called the flow state. And here it's called the ideal performance state. And it's characteristic of having the following, an absence of fear, so there's no fear of failure, you're not second guessing yourself, there's no analysis of the performance, you're not up in your head, you're, you're just flowing, a narrow focus of attention on the activity itself, so you're drowning out everything else, even the roar of the crowd just serves to further uh, focus your attention on the task. There's a sense of effortlessness, even though there's physical discomfort or pain or tiredness, you don't really feel it because you're in this flow state. It feels like you have a sense of personal control. You are in control of your body and the object, whether it's a ball or a bat or the opponent, you're in perfect control. And then there's a distortion of time and space. It's almost like time slows down and you can live almost a lifetime in those seconds between uh, making a break for the goal line and receiving the kick, right? Or it while you're taking the free throw, it just seems like time slows down, and this is called the ideal performance state. Now to achieve this performance state, we have to talk about a few things first. The first is arousal. This is a blend of physiological and psychological activation in an individual, and it refers to the intensity of motivation at any given moment. So how aroused are you, and I'm not talking about that kind of arousal, I'm talking about general psychological and physiological arousal. You could be passed out asleep, and that's a very, very low level of arousal, or you could be amped up out of your mind, ready to go, slapping yourself on the face because you're so psyched up. And it, you know, it might not be good to get quite that aroused, as we'll see with some of our theories here in a minute. So arousal goes from basically asleep to really, really psyched up. Anxiety is a subcategory of arousal that is a negatively perceived emotional state. Now there's two types of anxiety, cognitive and somatic. Cognitive uh, refers to the component of anxiety in your mind, it's the psychological component. And then somatic anxiety is the physical reaction, the physical manifestation of that anxiety in your body. Um, heart palpitations, tense muscles, um, uh, the, the dilation of your pupils. 
And then we have what's called state anxiety. State anxiety is the actual experience of apprehension and uncontrolled arousal. And we contrast this with, with trait anxiety. This is a personality characteristic, which represents a latent disposition to perceive situations as threatening. So state anxiety is the actual experience. When you are experiencing anxiety, that's state anxiety, and anybody can experience this. On the other hand, trait anxiety is kind of that uh, that type of, of latent level of anxiety that's sort of baked into your DNA. Different people have different levels of trait and anxiety. Some people have very high trait and anxiety, so they are typically, uh, they, their disposition is to perceive things as threatening. Now here are the relationships. It's a diagram of the relationships, let's zoom in, <clears throat> between uh, trait and state anxiety and then arousal and anxiety as well. So over here, under under traits, we see that uh, trait anxiety kind of exists on its own, that this is a genetic predisposition. And then over different states of anxiety, we have arousal, which can be good or bad, perceived as good or bad, rather. Remember, it is physiological and psychological. And then we have state anxiety, the perception of negative arousal, moment to moment changes in feelings of nervousness, worry, apprehension, etc. And then we have the two components of that state anxiety, cognitive, which is up in your thought life, and somatic, which is physiological throughout your body. Now the next concept to talk about here is stress. Stress is the substantial imbalance between demands and response capabilities under conditions in which failure has important consequences. So uh, the, there's those two criteria, right? You have to have the imbalance of your ability to meet the demands, and it has to be important. There has to be something on the line. So let's use the example of being in class. Imagine yourself back in the classroom and the teacher asks you a question and there's no points associated with the question. Uh, the teacher just asks you a right or wrong question and you answer, right? And there's a, maybe a low level of stress because it's in front of your peers and I know some of the more introverted among us might actually feel a lot of stress in that situation. But now contrast that, relatively low levels of stress because even if you don't have what it takes to answer that question, you don't have the knowledge, it's not like you're going to get punished or anything. You, you won't lose points. Contrast that to taking the final exam in that course. And there can be a lot of stress associated with that, especially if you didn't study the night before. Because those demands are high, you have to judge your ability to meet those demands. If you feel like you studied and you're just like nailing it and you're, you're getting you know, all of your flashcards correct, then maybe you have low levels of stress because you're confident going in, even though there's a important consequences for whether you succeed or fail. But now let's say maybe you come in and you didn't study well, you got a poor night of sleep, uh, you still don't understand some of the concepts, well now you're going to feel stressed out because there is a, a big consequence for failure on that final and you don't have what it takes, or you perceive that you don't have what it takes, and that is stress. Now, stress can be actually positive. This is called eustress or negative, distress. And we also have a stressor as a noun, which is an environmental or cognitive event that precipitates stress. So a stressor is something that causes stress in your life. Uh, training can be a stressor, right? It, it's a hopefully a eustressor, I don't know if that's a term, a positive thing that stresses you. It causes adaptation, but you can also have other things like relationship problems can be a stressor. Uh, your grades can be a stressor. The, your, um, you know, your dog at home that you have to take care of can be a stressor. Your kids, your work, your boss, these can all be stressors in your life. Now to start to tie some of these concepts together, um, we have a few theories. The first is drive theory. This theory says that as an individual's arousal or state anxiety increases, so too does their performance. Okay, so we've got this line, we've got arousal, and we'll go P for performance. As one increases, so does the other. Now there are some things that can affect this relationship. The first is the skill level. This can increase the latitude of optimal arousal. More skill corresponds to better performance at higher levels of arousal. So essentially, what we'll see here in a minute with the inverted U hypothesis, where once you get to a certain level of arousal, your performance goes down, like if you get too psyched up. However, the more skilled you are, that more psyched up you can be for that activity because you can still 
perform it, uh, you know, subconsciously or in your sleep, so to speak, with muscle memory. And so now you can be psyched up and you don't have to concentrate on the task relevant cues or anything. You can get into that flow state and be really amped up and still perform well if you're highly skilled. The other thing that affects it is sort of the inverse. It's not your skill level. It's the task complexity of, you know, of the thing that you are doing, of the task. Now with task complexity, simple or well-learned skills can tolerate higher degrees of arousal due to lower task relevant cues for an athlete to monitor. So the more cues you have to monitor, <clears throat> the lower the level of arousal needs to be because you still have to think. The fewer, the fewer cues you need to monitor, the higher your arousal can be. This is why in, say, uh, football practice, when you're doing a hitting practice, which you know, may or may not be happening as much anymore due to the prevalence of concussions. Uh, but when, when you're doing hitting pra practice, like I remember as a, I'm sorry, I remember as a middle school football player, yes, that's as far as my football career went. I was a running back, thank you very much. In middle school football practice, we would get so psyched up to just bash each other because there's not like a ton of task relevant cues to focus on, right? You just focus on not bringing your head down so you're not spearing the guy, hitting with your shoulder pad, and then and just running as fast as you can at the other person. It's pretty simple and you have to get amped up. Now contrast that with something like the pole vault. You can't get super, super psyched up for the pole vault, especially when you're just learning it because there are so many task relevant cues to focus on. And I did pole vault as well for one year, I think, in track my freshman year in high school. And there was a lot of things to have to remember. You had to hold the pole a certain way, you had to run a certain way, you had to plant a certain time, you had to like pull in sequence with the bend of the bar or of the pole as you went up and invert yourself. There's all kinds of things to focus on. Two very different uh, cues, both of them are two very different tasks, both of them involving running, uh, but a lot of different task relevant cues to focus on in the pole vault. Now here is that inverted U hypothesis or inverted U theory that I alluded to previously. And there's a few different tweaks we can make to it. Here is sort of the general inverted U theory, which states that arousal facilitates performance up to an optimal level, beyond which further increases in arousal are associated with reduced performance. And that's what we see right here on this downward slope. So if you get too amped up, then your performance level goes down. And then the following graphs show the changes based on task relevant uh, Q density. So, you know, how, how um, complex is the task or based on your skill level. So here we have a uh, high skill and competitive experience for an athlete. They can get more and more aroused and perform better and better than their low skilled counterpart. The low skilled counterpart, they can't get too aroused because they have to still focus on all of these uh, task relevant cues. Same thing down here with complex sports skills versus simple sports skills. The more simple the skill, the more and more aroused you need to get in order to achieve the optimal zone of performance between there and there. Complex skills, you need lower levels. And then finally, something we haven't talked about, the introverted and extroverted versions of the curve. Now, of course, we're not, it's not a binary thing. It's not like you're all introvert or all extrovert. We have varying levels of this. And so the more extroverted you are tends to be the higher levels of arousal that you need in order to perform optimally. Now we can add another level of individualization to the optimal arousal curves by theorizing that there are individual zones of optimal functioning. And this theory states that different people perform best with very different levels of arousal. So regardless of whether you know uh, that one of your athletes is an introvert or an extrovert or whether they are highly skilled at something or whether you know all of the task relevant cues for the, um, for the sport that they're competing, you can't really predict the optimal level of arousal. It's gonna be highly individual. And so these theories just give us a ballpark estimation to better understand what's going on in the minds of our athletes and in ourselves when we are competing. Now, furthermore, there's what's called the catastrophe theory. This is when further increases in arousal cause a catastrophic drop in performance. You, you know, you, you're optimal in this zone, but then suddenly you go too far and it just plummets. There's sort of this cascade of uh, negative events that happens when you go too far. It's like dominoes all falling. And then we have also the reversal theory. 
And this says that the effect of arousal and anxiety on performance depends on how they are interpreted. So they're a little bit under our control, right? And so with the reversal theory now, we start to see, okay, maybe, maybe we can start to interpret some of these uh, arousal and thoughts of anxiety differently. Maybe we can change the way that our mind deals with these thoughts so that we can achieve the optimal levels of arousal regardless of the range of, um, of arousal. So one athlete may interpret high levels of arousal as excitement, right? So you could be excited and feel ready for performance while another might be experiencing that same high level of arousal but might interpret it as unpleasant. And you know, they might think that they are not confident and that's why they're nervous, et cetera. But now we, can start, now we know we can start to train these athletes uh, in order to interpret these differently so that maybe this athlete who experiences it as unpleasant, maybe they have this routine down now that they can actually start to feel excited at the same levels of arousal. We're gonna see how to do that in a future video. All right, so that brings us to the end of this topic, but we have to keep talking. We have to keep going through a few more topics to get to how do we actually positively impact our athletes in these high stress performance situations. So we've talked about arousal and stress and anxiety, but next we are going to talk about motivation and attention and focus. And these are three more really important concepts to start to bring this whole picture together of sports psychology. So. Click on over to the next video. It's gonna pop up somewhere on the screen. If you guys have questions about this, let me know down in the comments. As always, it was great hanging out with you guys. I'd love to see you over on the next video. Until then, stay strong, move well, and be good. Button sequence, they'll go to the wrong planet or something. I don't know a lot about space. Um, <laughs> so dumb. Ugh.